The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. Tonight happens to be the 50th anniversary of the passing of Ajahn Lee Damodaro, who was my teacher's teacher. And so I thought I'd like to talk about him tonight. Um, practically everything I've gained as a meditator, as a practitioner, I owe to him and to his teachings. Never met him personally, but through my teacher, uh, John Fuang's um, stories about him and uh, to d translating his works, I've got a very strong sense of him as a person and also as a, as I think, a really amazing Dharma teacher. Um, it, and particularly tonight, I'd like to talk about his teachings that might be relevant to your practice um, or our practice now, 50 years later. There are a lot of stories about Ajahn Lee. Um, in Thailand, to this day, he is mainly known for his psychic powers. Um, and there are some pretty cool stories about that, but I, that'll be just entertainment. Um, <laughs> for something more useful, I'd like to talk about some of his, his teachings. He had done, spent most of his time practicing in the forest. He had some practice or some time as a student monk in Bangkok but was pretty minimal. But he was an autodidact. He read an awful lot. And his teachings, I think, are a really interesting combination of a lot of practice and um, some, some book knowledge about the, what the Buddha had to teach. Back in that time in particular, Thailand was in a period where they were still recovering from the invasion in Ayutthaya. The, the Pali Canon was available, not too much in the commentaries was available. What was available in terms of the Pali Canon, the translations in Thai were very stilted and very much not based on anybody's practical practical experience. It's more just the, the book says this word means this, so we plug it right in. And um, what I think, so the translations came out pretty stilted and not all that helpful. What I think was amazing about it, John Lee was his ability to put together his practice and the Pali Canon in a way I think that was. Um, it gets at a lot of the Buddha's important teachings and also brings them alive and, and was based on his own experience. Um, for me, when I first started practicing meditation, one of his teachings I found most useful was his understanding of how you play with the breath. When you meditate, you don't just sit there and watch in, out, in, out, in, out. How many more minutes do I have to have in, out, in, out? It's, you work with the breath. The breath is not a given. The breath is something that the mind it's one of the few processes of the body that you actually can have some control over. And the Buddha himself called it what he called bodily fabrication. It's one of the intentional elements that you have to shape your experience of the body. And so John Lee would focus on how to make use of that fact that you really do have a role in shaping your breath. If you're trying to sit here and meditate, why not breathe in a way that feels really good? Um, his conception of the breath was not just you know, the air coming in and out of the lungs, and this is typical in Thailand in general, but the idea of breath as being the energy that flows throughout the whole body. Very similar to the Hindu concept of prana, the Chinese concept of chi. Um, that you've got breath flowing through your blood vessels, you've got breath flowing you, through your, your nerves. Sort of as a cocoon around your body, there's a kind of a breath energy as well. And he was saying, you know, try to make use of that as you meditate. You talk about breathing in different rhythms. You could try in long and out long, in short, out short, in short, out long, in long, out short, to see what rhythm of breathing feels best. And also to think of the breath energy flowing in different parts of the body. You know, where do you feel blockages in your energy? There should be a flow that goes down the back, down the spine, out the legs and out to the toes. There should be a flow that starts at the middle of the chest around the, around the sternum, goes down through your organs and down, down to the... Uh, down to the colon, um, breath flowing in, the, in, the, in your arms, breath energy in your eyes, in your ears. Have you ever really looked into that? It's something you can explore. Um, and as you're working with it, it's not, you're not avoiding the kind of the given. There's a, there's a general belief that when, when you meditate, you just have to sit with whatever is there and learn to be patient with what's ever there. Um, as the, as Again, both the Buddha and John Lee would point out, the breath is something that's not just there. You have a role in shaping it. So you might as well shape it in a way that's useful for two reasons. One is that 
it just it's a lot easier to sit and meditate when your body feels comfortable. I mean, if there's pains in different parts of the body, you can think of the breath energy just going right through the pain. Um, say there's a pain in your knee, think of the breath energy going down the leg and out through the calf and out through the toes. So you don't allow the pain to block the flow of the energy in the body. Remember that they, basically they, the breath was there first, the pain comes later. So give the breath some priority. And this way you begin to look also into the way you perceive the sensations in your body, which ones are kind of there, which ones are things that you actually have a role in shaping. Um, John Lee came across this method in two stages. The first stage, he went to India to visit the Buddha's holy spots, and um, this was way back in the days before there were buses and, and hotels and things at the holy spots. He basically camped out. And as he was looking around, he noticed all these Hindu sadhus who were um, you know, sitting under the sun lying on bales of and beds of nails. And the question arose in his mind, how do they do that? And his way of answering it was, was typical of John Lee. Instead of asking anybody, he'd sit and meditate and pose the question, okay, what are they doing? And the message he gave, got from his meditation was they're playing with the breath energy in the body. This is what enables them to do these things. So he, so he started trying that himself. Came back to Thailand, wrote up a book based on working with the breath energy. In his first version of the technique, it was primarily in the head, working with the breath energy around the forehead and the top of the head, the middle of the head, and the neck. A few years later, he was spending a rains retreat out in the forest, and it was in a place where he had to walk in three days to get there. And soon after he got there, he had a heart attack. And what would you do? You're in the forest, you know, three days away, walking you know, from any kind of road, um, living off the hill tribes, uh, uh, alms food. And Hill Tribes alms food is mainly bamboo shoots. And according to Thai medicine, the worst thing you can eat if you're having a heart trouble is bamboo shoots. So what are you going to do? He started playing with his breath. So let's use the breath to cure the body. And so he found that by working with the breath and the energy in the different parts of the body, he actually kind of put himself back together again. Walked out at the end of the rains retreat and then wrote down method two. If you look in the library here, there's some, his book, Keeping the Breath in Mind, that says method one, method two. Um, my teacher always taught method two. I know a few people who prefer method one, but by and large, John Lee himself would teach method two. And he later connected this ability to play with the breath with the Buddhist teachings on um, two factors of jhana, or right concentration, which are directed thought, vidaka, and evaluation, vichana. In other words, you, you direct your mind at the breath in different ways, you conceive it in breath in different ways, hold those pictures of the breath in mind, and then evaluate. How does that work with the body? How does that help you with the body? In getting a sense of feeling solidly in the body, having a sense of being able to settle, settle down with the body and feel comfortable and feel at ease. The image the Buddha gives is of a, a bathman working water through a pile of bath powder. Now back in those days they didn't have soap. They would take bath powder and then they would mix water in it with it to make a dough. And then you'd rub the dough over your body. And the image there is taking the water and working it through the powder so that in the same way that you would mix water with fl flour to make bread. You're trying to moisten the entire lump of dough. And so you have to work, you have to knead the water through. In the same way you're, as you're working with the breath energy in the body, you're kind of kneading that sense of pleasure you start with a, a pleasant sense of the breath, an easeful sense of the breath, and you start kneading that through the body, allowing it to come through. Um, that, as I said, this helps the mind settle down so that it really is a lot easier to stay in the present moment. And it puts the mind in a much better mood to look at your defilements. Um, defilement is one of those dirty words we don't use in uh, Western Buddhism too much, uh, largely because you're coming, like today, you're coming home from work, five, you know, working all day, you just had a little meal, come here to sit and meditate, and someone tells you you have defilements in your mind? No. Um, most of us feel pretty frazzled and don't even deal with them. And, and a lot of the Dharma teaching that deals with greed, aversion, and delusion says, well, actually, you have to become intimate with your defilements, be kind to them, be gentle to them. And that sounds a lot nicer at the end of a long day's work. However, it doesn't get rid of them. You, if you're kind and gentle to the animals that come in your house, what do they do? You know? <laughs> they stay. <laughs> and sometimes they pee on the carpet. I mean, they, and so you, you can't be just gentle with them. You have to teach, treat them with a certain amount of suspicion. When greed comes, how can you 
Can you really, you know, trust your greed to tell you what you can do and not suffer? Can you trust your anger? Can you trust your delusion? One of John Lee's analogies, and he was a great person for analogies. He says it's like friends who, you know, talk you into committing a crime, and then when the cops come, they run away, and you're left holding the, you know, holding the bag. So if your mind, however, has been, you've been practicing concentration with a strong sense of ease that fills the body, you're in a much better mood to say, well, yeah, when greed comes along, it really does cause problems. You know? When anger comes along, you learn how to separate yourself from these things. Not that you deny they're there, you admit they're there, but you step back from them a bit and you say, okay, when greed comes into the mind, when lust comes into the mind, when anger comes into the mind, what kind of effect does it have? And if, the, and if you've been sitting sort of drenched in a sense of ease and fullness from the breath, it's a lot easier to say, okay, these things really are problems, let's look into them. Because that's another aspect of John Lee's talks, uh, teachings, is the very active role that he gives to an analyzing what's going on in the mind. He wrote a book on um, Satipatthana, I've translated it as Frames of Reference, and again, that's available in the library, um, in which Unlike most books, which tend to focus, one, on the idea of mindfulness is simply accepting whatever comes up, he actually went back to the original canonical meaning, which is also the standard meaning in Thai. Mindfulness is just the ability to keep something in mind. You remember. For instance, you remember to stay with the breath, you remember to stay with feelings, whatever it is, the topic that you've chosen to stay with. But you add two other qualities, and this is the theme throughout the book. It's this combination of three qualities of mind. There's mindfulness, keeping something in mind. Alertness, actually watching what's going on, both in the object that you're watching and making sure that your mind is also staying with the object. What effect is that object having on the mind? What effect is the mind having on the object? And then the third quality, which is ardency, which is really looking into well, what's going on here. Is it skillful? Is it not skillful? If it's not skillful, what can you do about it so it doesn't have an impact? And the, the image he gives, he, the, the a translation he gives in Thai of the word ardency, uh, two translations, one is that you make the effort to stare at something and you make the effort to burn it up. Now burning up for him doesn't mean that you just kind of obliterate it, but you try to reduce it to its basic elements. Okay, when greed comes in, why is it there? Why, do you, why would you go for greed? What does it do for you? And you say, well, it does have some good things. But it also has some bad things. Well, can you get the good things without the bad things? Can you still, you know, get up and work in the morning without greed? There are, you do have other reasons for getting up in the morning, right? Besides greed. Um, and you have to learn how to see, okay, which part here is the unskillful part, which part is the skillful part? Can we take them apart? So that you have the energy that you would need in order to do what needs to be done, and yet not feel that you have to be motivated by greed, because greed will often well, we've seen greed. You know. Back in the 1980s, greed was good, right? <laughs> Look what it's done to us. You know. it's, it's torn our country apart. So you have to get the mind in a position where it feels at ease, where it feels refreshed from the breath. And then you can start looking at these things. And this is another aspect of it, John Lee's teachings I always found useful. is that He doesn't divide mindfulness practice from concentration practice. And he doesn't divide insight practice from tranquility practice. They go together. They work together. In order to get the mind to settle down, okay, if you have a place where it's, if your body doesn't feel comfortable, it's not a good place to settle down, work through it. What, what are the problems with the energy in your body? Learn how to get in touch with it. Learn how to work through these things. Um, an image I use, I don't use it in Thailand, but I use here, is of a dog lying down to sleep. Um, you talk about dogs in Thailand, people get upset. But if you've noticed a dog lying down, does the dog just plop, lie down? Usually it lies down, whoops, there's a root, so it gets up and it scratches there. And it get, lies down again, whoops, there's a stone, gets up and scratches there, until it finally has a nice place where it can settle down. And, and in the same way, when you're, when you're meditating, you meditate, oh my gosh, there's a pain right here, there's some blockage right there, well, let's work through it. And as you work through it, you're, you're with the body, you're in the present moment, and you're also creating a place where the mind really can settle down more solidly. So you learn how to think strategically. You, know, you learn how to use your insight in order to, or your powers of analysis to get the mind to settle down. When the mind is settled down, then your powers of analysis have a much firmer basis for doing more detailed 
analysis of what's going on, both in the body and in the mind. And so you use this sense of pleasure not to get stuck on the pleasure, but you use it as a way of preparing the mind so it can look more deeply in to what's actually going on. Um, if I were to give one sort of short sentence to describe a John Lee's approach to meditation, is he approached it as a skill. We're not just sitting here doing whatever we're told to do. You're doing it and then you're evaluating the results and then you adjust it to fit your particular circumstances right now. How can your mind settle down? What particular defilements are you dealing with right now? And then learn how to evaluate how it's working. So again, it's not just you know, noting, 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 or scanning, scanning, scanning. It's okay, getting the mind with the breath. Something's wrong, okay, analyze it for a while, then sit with it for a while. Analyze it again, sit with it, until you really feel that you can stay with it. And then you learn to use that sense of pleasure. Learn how to maintain it, learn how to use it strategically. And John Lee has many teachings along these lines. One is that um, the teaching on self and not self. You know, we you know here we all we're all told things are inconstant or impermanent. They're stressful or suffering, and they're not self. Let go, okay? And John Lee says that's letting go like a pauper. You don't have anything left, you know. Before you let go, first you've got to develop some good things in, in the mind. In other words, you take things that are stressful, like the breath, or some things that are inconstant, like the mind, and you learn how to make them more constant and more pleasurable. You, things that are ultimately not self, but you begin to push the li limits or push the envelope. Well, how much can I control my mind? How much can I really get it to settle down? How, come, how much can I work with the breath energy? And you find that there's an awful lot you can do. And so in this way you're sort of fighting against those three characteristics, pushing the envelope to see how far it can go. Then when the mind is in a better state like that, okay, then you can start looking at, okay, where, even when I've pushed this as far as I can go, what still is inconstant, what still is stressful, what still is not self. And that way you've, you learn about these teachings by pushing against them. It's the same with your approach to the five aggregates. If you look at the state of concentration, you've got all five aggregates together, but they're in a very pleasant state. And we're told the five aggregates are stressful, but when you focus on the breath and the sense of ease, your form feels good, the feelings feel good, the perception feels restful, thought con whatever fabrications you have going on in your mind, they're actually giving rise to a sense of ease. Your consciousness feels really good right there. You've taken the five aggregates and you've turned them into something pleasant. So that you can see, okay, ultimately you, you get really familiar with them by mastering them. And when you've mastered these things, then you can start look in, looking into, okay, where, on what subtle level is there something that you cannot control? What is something that is still inconstant in here? And this way you, instead of just simply accepting what the Buddha had to say, you push against it. And you learn more about yourself. At the same time, as John Lee says, okay, when you finally, when you do let go, you let go like a wealthy person. Okay, you let go of your wealth, but it means you don't carry it around. You've got plenty back in your house. If you ever need it, you've got it there to use it. You think about the Buddha. You know, he, after he had let go on the night of his awakening, it wasn't like he had nothing left. He still had his powers of concentration, he still had his discernment, he still had all these skills that he had developed. And so it was just learn, you learn how to let go of the things that are weighing down the mind. And then whatever's left, you learn how to use it as you, as you have it remaining. So I think it's his, John Lee's approach to the practice, this approaching it as a skill, thinking strategically. Remember, all the Buddhist teachings that we have are part of right view, which is part of the path. He's not telling us, believe this and you've, you know, you will, you'll get the stamp of the Buddha's approval. That's not what we're here for. He says, if you take these assumptions and you work with them, they will form a path. Again, the Buddha's teachings itself is strategic. The image of a path is not that you would lie down there. You get on the road and you follow it to the end. And you go down to the end and the road doesn't cause, say you take a road to a mountain, the road doesn't cause the mountain to be, the fact that you're following the path doesn't cause, cause it to be, but it gets you there. And when you get there, then you can let it go. Because even ultimately with the teachings on <coughs> what's stressful and inconstant and not self, that gets let go as well. It's part of the path. So I think it's important that we look at using the Buddhist teachings strategically, learning how to take advantage of 
the breath that we have in the body. This is another theme that John Lee would stress again and again. Is that You've got a lot of good things in your body, but you don't appreciate them. And the breath energy can do an awful lot. You know, when you're sick, you, and again, in his case, well, he had a heart attack. He was able to use the breath to pull himself back together again. When you're out and it's cold at night, you just focus on warm breathing. It warms you up. There's an awful lot of these elements, these potentials in the body that you can make use of, similarly with the mind. There are a lot of potentials that the mind has in terms of its powers of observation, learning how to use your ingenuity. When, the, when John Lee was talking about meditating, he means bring the whole mind to the, pro, to the process of meditation. It's not just you know drumming it down with one technique. You say, okay, learn how to bring your powers of ingenuity, learn how to use your imagination. This is typical in the way that John Munn, John Lee's teacher, would teach him. John Lee was his attendant for one range retreat, and John Munn would never tell him where the right places to put things were. But he'd just tell him he put them in the wrong place. And it was up to John Lee to figure out, well, how am I going to figure out, especially when he closes the door to his room and I can't see? What does he do? Well, that was back in the days when you had bamboo leaf walls on huts. He pokes a hole in the wall. <laughs> he looks, you know. You use the ingenuity, you try to find out. As a, a John Fuhr once said, my teacher once said, and I think he picked this up from a John Lee, that if you really want to learn the Dharma, you have to learn how to think like a thief. Don't expect your teacher to tell you everything. If you're going to go steal somebody's, in some, somebody's house, do you go up to the door and knock on the door and say, when are you going to be here? Um, when are you going to be away? And by, by the way, where do you keep your stuff? You know, you, know. you scout the joint, you know. You watch them, you watch them on the other side of the street and try to figure out, okay, when do they come and when do they seem to be, what, what part of the house do they seem to be especially protective of? You don't try to figure these things out. I myself was the victim of this kind of training. Um, and I say victim because it was, it was hard. You know, he'd say, this is, this is in the wrong place. And sometimes I'd put a teacup in the wrong place, he'd actually pick it up and throw it. Um, and so I'd have to figure out, well, when he puts the teacup, where does he put it? Um, and it's, it's a useful skill to develop in your meditation because then you, because when you have problems in your meditation, you can't expect a teacher to be right there to hold your hand and take you through it all the time. You've got to figure out, okay, I've got a problem right now. What can I do? Well, you've got the breath. What, can, what ways can you work with the breath? One of the things I appreciated, and as I came to translate more and more of John Lee's writings, and especially his Dharma talks, was that even after he had worked out that method working uh, method two in, the, in keeping the breath in mind, he never stopped playing with the breath and figuring out new ways of moving the breath energy through the body to deal with different problems. And it wasn't like somebody told him these ways. He played. He experimented. And some things you know, might not have worked, but other things did. And I think it's an important attitude to develop as a meditator. Things aren't going well. What can you do to change it? You don't just sit there and suffer. Yeah, people gained awakening just by sitting and suffering, as a John Cha once said, all the chickens in the world would be, you know, enlightened by now. Um, yeah. You've got to use your imagination, you've got to use your ingenuity, use your powers of observation. If there's any one message from a John Lee's teachings, I think that would be it. Learn how to observe. Learn how to test things. And as you test things, you gain lessons that you're going to remember all your life, much more than you would learn from reading them in a book or hearing them in a Dharma talk. So I think the advice I would give, in taking a John Lee as an example, is learn how to experiment and learn how to make use of the potentials you have, both in the body and the mind, that you may not really fully have learned how to use yet. That's the message I'd like to leave with you tonight. Are there any questions? Comments. Hi, thank you. Um, so this invitation to sort of assess or analyze mm -hmm. makes my little mind go crazy with anticipation because I could think about all this stuff for mm -hmm. a really long time. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could give some guidance on how to do that without it being just sitting and thinking, thinking. a lot. Okay, well again, you're working with the breath energy. And the breath energy will tell you, hey, this is not working. 
you say, okay, let's, let's sit with this for a while. I'm going to breathe, thinking of the breath energy flowing through, say, my nerves. And just hold that thought in mind for a while. And when you test something, it's not, you know, five seconds of testing. Sit with it for half an hour. And then at the end of the half hour, come out and say, how was that? Did it work? And if it didn't seem to work, well, what, what was the problem? How, am I, what, how do I feel when I come out from this? And sometimes you don't have to <laughs> sit for half an hour. You, you, you focus on the breath and certainly say, no, this is not working at all. Other times it will take a while. So, but you're, you're dealing with sort of the elements in the body. And you know, when you push against them, sometimes they will push back. But um, try to think of any skill that you've developed, a physical skill, and try to bring that same attitude toward this. On the one hand, you do want results, but on the other hand, if your wanting gets too strong, it's going to get in the way of actually observing what you're doing. Um, the John Lee's example or image that he would use would be, you know, you're learning how to weave baskets. Well, you weave a basket. You do the whole thing, and then you look at it. And you say, okay, what is the shape right? How about the weave? Does the weave look fine enough? And then next time you try to weave a new basket, based on what you've learned from the last time. Yeah. So it's not purely imagination or purely an analysis. You're trying to analyze, what am I doing? How am I relating to my breath energy? Right here, right now. Thank you. You suggested some of the experiments we could do with the breath would be long, short, short, long. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that uh, different pressures on the diaphragm and pushing on the internal organs are useful. Is that one? And can you suggest others? The, the issue of how much pressure you're putting on the breath, how much, um, how heavy the breath is. You do want a heavier breath or lighter breath, faster, slower, deeper, more shallow. Um, again, thinking about breathing in and out your eyes breathing in and out your ears. If you have a headache, I've found one of the best things to do is to lower your focus. So don't focus right on the head. Focus hands of the feet, soles of the hands, palms of the palms of the hands, soles of the feet. Um, I, I, I suffer from spoonerisms. Um, uh, let's see. Gosh, there's so many things you can do with the breath. Um, Think of the breath coming in and out the chakras, the front chakras, the back chakras as well. Um, if there's a tightness in any one part of the body, if it's in the upper part of the body, think of allowing it to spread out your arms and out the palms of your hands. If it's in the lower part of the body, think of it going out the soles of your feet. Um, uh, think about, sometimes I've found, you know, I've played with the breath energy so much it's totally screwed up. Um, in which case you think about, about the first inch of space around your body and think about, okay, just think of breath it's kind of flowing nicely there. Um, a lot of us picked up as children the idea that when you breathe in you have to pull the breath in through the nose. And a good way to counteract that is to think of the breath energy coming in back at the base of the skull. So when you breathe in it comes in here and goes down the spine. Or it can go down the shoulders. So those are some things that I found useful. So, uh, would you like to comment on the uh, the relationship between all the analysis and the invitation to non-judgment that uh, has been frequently mentioned as one of the central themes? Well, the non-judgment is that we have some pretty bad standards for judging things that we picked up. And you have to learn how to put them down for the time being, so you can actually look, well, what actually is going on? Now, once you see what is going on, you will be able to see, you will be in a much better position to make more skillful judgments. Now, the Buddha never said not to be judge, not to make judgments. Um, you have to make a distinction several levels here. One, the distinction between being judgmental and being judicious. And judgmental basically means you know, passing judgment with not enough evidence based on some pretty dumb standards. That's judgmental. Judicious is you have more intelligent standards and you're willing to ta you take in more evidence before you pass judgment. Because when you look at the Buddha's teachings, one of his most basic teachings is that 
there is a distinction between suffering and not suffering, you know? And there's a distinction between skillful behavior and unskillful behavior. The skillful behavior is to be developed, the unskillful is to be abandoned. Now, basically what he's teaching you is how to judge that distinction skillfully. So he's not telling you not to judge at all. He says, look at your standards for judgment and see to what extent they actually are making you happier and making the people around you happier. And the whole idea of being totally non-judgmental comes down to the idea, well, people are suffering because they're neurotic. You know the distinction between psychosis and neurosis? The psychotic you know, thinks that one, one plus one equals three. A neurotic knows that one plus one equals two, but hates it for him. Hates them for it. <laughs> and so if, you know, if, we're, if, we're, if we're suffering simply because you know, we have this neurotic hatred of things, okay, learn how to be less judgmental. But the Buddha says there's a lot more going on than just neurosis. Our, our behavior really is harmful. I mean, we act because we want happiness, but we end up causing suffering for ourselves and for other people. Why is that? He says, one, because we're not paying attention, and two, we're letting our cravings get in the way of seeing what's really going on. But he's not saying, well, just accept everything as it is and everything's going to be fine. You've got to retrain yourself. And again, it's if you can learn how to breathe in a way that feels really comfortable, you're in a much better position to start looking into, okay, where is my judgment unskillful? Where can I make it more skillful? And that would come from examining the assumptions behind the judgment. Right. Mm -hmm. And some of those assumptions are the kind that if you actually bring them up into the light of the day, they would kind of wither away. And others you really hold on to tight. And so you've got to ask yourself, well, why am I holding on tight? And that requires you to get the mind even more still and more inquisitive to sort of catch the movements that will indicate, well, this is why I'm actually holding on to this. Yes, I have a question about how it sounded like your training with your teacher uh, had some unpleasantness to it. Uh, I'm curious as to how you knew, or did you know that was the proper teacher for you? I know, I just felt a very strong sense of rapport and trust. I mean, even the times when it was unpleasant, I never felt that he was doing anything that was not in my best interest. Whether he was going to do anything that was consciously harming me. And did you search before you found him? I did. But, um, and part of it was, I don't know if this is really a good standard, but I really liked his sense of humor. Um, we seem to click on that level. And there's some things in a John Lee where I thought, well, yeah, John Lee was, had the same sort of sense of humor. And this is why I find it's kind of a universal around the, the forest tradition. Some night I could can give a talk on that, why, why humor is a sign of wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't easy. I mean, he was. My teacher's his health was pretty bad for the last several years of his life, and I was his personal attendant. And the reason I became his personal attendant was because all the other monks ran away. Because when he was when John Fung was sick, he had a really sharp tongue, and a lot of people just couldn't take it. But, and he has, but he, say, he mentioned one time, he says, the reason I criticize people is, you know, if they're going to stay, they're going to stay. I know who's going to stay and who's not going to stay this way. Uh, and so I, and it, you know, it, was, it was a really good lesson. I mean, he never criticized me in a way that was, you know, um, made me lose hope in myself. It was more just, you know, just challenging me further. And one typical thing that he would do would be, he would ask for something. And when he was sick, um, he would revert to the accent of his native province, which was different from standard time. And you speak very softly, he'd ask for something. And I'd have to figure, well, what does he want? And then I made the mistake one time, I said, what was that you said? And he got up and he crawled over the room and he got what he wanted. And so the next time I figured, okay, well, what does it look like he needs? I'll give him this, you know. And if it's not what he wants, he'll let me know and then I'll you know, find something else. Um, but it was, you know, it was, 
it was challenging, but you know, when, when I did it right, it felt really, really good. Um, I'll tell you two stories before we go. Um, one was he had been sick. He had this rheumatoid psoriasis. It's a bizarre disease. It starts in the bones and comes out in the skin. And the only thing that would really work for with these attacks he would get would be a really deep body massage. And I couldn't give that. You know, some people can give massages and other people can't. I'm not a massage giver. Um, so we had to wait for this one monk. And this one monk had, had a grudge against the John Fu, and so he would wait a couple of days and then show up and give him the treatment. And so one time he showed up at 10 o'clock at night, and I'd been up two or three nights with the John Fu, because you have to use hot compresses and other things to, to help with the disease and getting two hours of sleep at night. And so the, the monk came and gave the massage, and so John Fung, you know, the, the massage ended at midnight, and John Fung turned to me and he said he asked for a spoon of coffee, kafei chon, in Thai. And a spoon of coffee, what, what kind of spoon of coffee? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but I figured, well, maybe it's something I don't know. I'll go down and ask the people in the kitchen. So we went down and woke up the people in the kitchen and said, John Fung wants a spoon of coffee. And they said, Spoon of coffee, what does that mean? You know, does he want it granulated coffee, or does he want it mixed, or you know, you know, dissolved in hot water or what? And we said, well, maybe I guess the hot water, I don't know. So we got him some hot water and had a little spoonful of coffee in the glass. And I took it back to his hut. And as I got to the stairway at the bottom of his hut, I thought, oh my gosh, he yeah, probably asked for a coffee spoon, which is the words flipped backwards in Thai, chong of And so I just kind of melted down and started laughing. And he said, what are you laughing about? I said, you wanted a coffee spoon, right? He said, yeah. I got you a spoon of coffee, because <laughs> I thought that's what you said, that's what you asked for. <laughs> and so he didn't say anything. I found it later, he mentioned it to one of his students, and he said, you know, he you know, had been up for two nights and probably had said a spoon of coffee, and <laughs> he was kind of blurry, too. Um, and he had this, um, what's, what's the English word for the quality I showed just there? No, there's a, there's a Thai term, term su. Um, but there was another time when he'd been sick the same way, and this time the, the monk came at about 8 o'clock and finished the massage. And so some people from the kitchen came up and they brought, the, brought some cocoa for John Fung because he hadn't been eating for those two days. And that was back in the days when we thought cheese was allowable in the evening, so they brought up a little cheese. And the monk was sitting there talking to John Fung after the massage was over and saying, you know, I really feel sorry for you. you know, here you are stuck out here with nobody to look after you except this you know, foreign monk who sometimes understands what you say and sometimes doesn't understand what you say. I kept thinking, gosh, don't rub it in, please, come on. <laughs> and so John Fung, after a minute or two, asked for some tissue. Now the word for tissue in Thai is kodat. The word for cheese is nai. Now these are two totally different words, right? Okay. And the monk somehow heard that a John Fung asked for some cheese. So he offered the cheese. And I offered the tissue paper. And so a John Fung took the tissue paper and said, you can do what you want with that cheese. I want some tissue paper. I felt so good. <laughs> I mean, it's little things, but your meditation is also little things, you know. You know where you're going to focus, how you're going to breathe. When greed comes in, that little moment where greed says, you really want to go along with me, don't you? And you say, yeah. Or an old addiction comes along and says, you're, giving, you're, you're, you're refusing to give in right now, but in five minutes you're going to give in, so give in now anyhow, and then just get, it, get it over with. And you learn how to say, no, you recognize that for what it is. It's the little things that count. So. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm wondering about the um, instruction uh, of sitting with what is happening in meditation mm -hmm. and, um, and your point of view about playing with the breath. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I find it very, you know, I find myself actually doing that to some degree, but mm -hmm. sort of feeling um, at times like I'm allowing myself to distract myself um, from what is actually present. Okay, well, again, what is actually present is something that you're helping to shape anyhow. So you might as well learn how to shape it well. There's not a given experience. I mean, this is one of the Buddhist, you know, little ad for this Saturday, um, the Buddhist teachings on karma and causality. Your present moment is composed of results of past actions plus your current actions working together. 
past actions send potentials, your current actions actualize them. Now, there's some issues that come up in the mind. You do have to just sit with them for a while in order to get a sense of what's going on. And the same with the breath. You try adjusting the breath in different ways, and nothing really seems worth, you know, or something, able to, something you'd be able to settle down with. Sit with it for a while. Just say, okay, I'll just be with whatever's there. So does the intent to um, remove pain, for instance, mm -hmm. sitting, enter into this in terms of um, a actually having the intent, letting mm -hmm. the intent be present and mm -hmm. moving the breath with mm -hmm. that intent? Yeah, that, that's perfectly fine. Now you find that there are some pains that no breath method is going to deal with. But if you've been working with the breath so there's parts of the body that feel comfortable, you know you've got a place you can go if the pain gets really bad. And that puts you in a position where you don't feel so threatened by the pain. You say, okay, let's look at it. Let's go into it. Because I know in the back of the mind, if it really gets bad, I have a place to go. Because the whole point, of, eventually, the whole point of dealing with pain, both physical and mental, is to learn how to comprehend it. And to comprehend it, you can't feel threatened by it. You have to be able to sit with it. And if you have, if you have a sense of competence, that okay, this is not going to get too bad for me, you can you you get more um, adventuresome. Thank you. When I was after I'd studied with a John Fung couple months before I came back to the States and then I eventually returned to Thailand. But during that period when I was back in the States for a year and a half, I was back at my old alma mater. And it was a college where the psych department seemed to run the college, i.e. everybody's name was put on one of these on, uh, random number generators for psych experiments. And you would be called for psych experiment any time. And during my time as a, an undergrad, I'd only been called up once. But that one year I was back, I was called up a couple times. And one, one time was particularly relevant to the meditation, which was, the experiment was this. They had a, a, a bucket of ice water with lots of ice cubes, and they told you to put your hand in it. And what turned out, I didn't, you didn't know at the time, that they had three groups. One group was told, move your hand, remove your hand as soon as it starts getting painful. The second group was told, keep your hand in there as long as you can. The third group was told, Put your hand in there and think of the coldness of the hand going to the other hand and the warmth of this hand going into that hand. And I happened to be in the third group, and I'd already been meditating. And so after five minutes they said, ah, you can stop now. <laughs> You're breaking the curve. <laughs> but the point of that is if you feel that you have a technique to deal with these things, you feel a lot more competent, confident and competent in handling these things. And when you feel more confident in the pace, the pace of pain, you're going to understand it better. So it's good to have a few backup techniques. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.